Um, on behalf of the Summer at Your Library Project team, myself, Trish Garone, Carrie Johnson, and Holly McChris, a warm welcome. Thank you all for joining us today for planning for equity-based summer services and decision-making. Um, the Summer at Your Library Project is a program of the California Library Association supported by the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of LSTA administered in California by the state librarian. Um, and before we get in sort of into the workshop, Holly, uh, do you want to start us off with any workshop logistics Zoom housekeeping? Yes, good morning and welcome. Um, if you are not uh, speaking, if you can have your mute going, that'd be awesome. Um, and it might be that we ask you to turn your cameras off too, just to help with the broadband, but at this point, everything's great. Uh, we also have the ability for a live transcription, which you can find at the bottom of your screen, either as a CC, if you click on that, you see the options of how to do the live transcription, which you can either just have it scrolling at the bottom of your screen or show on the side as a show transcription. If you do show transcription, it will take the place of your chat, but you can go back and forth and that's not a problem. If you don't see that live transcription button on the bottom of your screen, it's either hidden underneath your more or your little three dots, which you'll find um, in the same place on your Zoom screen at the bottom, but you can turn on transcription or you can turn it off if you don't want it. It is going right now. Great. Is that, is that it, Holly? Great. And, um, and actually, Trish, uh, let's do our poll. Cool. And this is Linda, who I'll be introducing in just a bit, but she's going to get a poll started first. Yeah, we have a poll. I'm going to launch it. And it's one question for you um, and asking you just, have you started to intentionally talk about equity in your summer services? I'll just give you a minute. Holly and I will watch uh, the time. Oh, I'll watch the time. Can you watch, Holly? <laughs> it, I can't see it. So Okay, so that's fine. I am watching the numbers of votes and I'll just see how many we have in. Uh, we're pretty good. 72% of you voted. Great. So just simple yes, no. Just a couple more people to vote. And uh, let's see, I'll give it another uh, eight seconds, 10 seconds. And if you've just joined the call, if you could, oh. No, right. they can't. Oh, they can't. Sorry. <laughs> right, that's okay. All right, so I'm gonna uh, end the poll and then show the results and share the results. So 70% um, have started to intentionally talk about equity and summer services. That's fantastic. And you're gonna get some more time to think about that. Uh, but thank you, that's great to know as we get this started. Trish, now great. you can- Great, so I'm just gonna, Try and speak quickly, give you just a little bit of background about today's workshop and then introduce our amazing uh, team of presenters. So for the past year, the project staff of Summer at Your Library have really been rethinking what resources and evaluation tools we offer to help California libraries deliver high quality, equitable summer programs in their communities. And with the guidance of Linda Braun, Lakeisha Kimbrough, and a team of 28 co-designers from 14 library jurisdictions, we've been working on developing an approach to summer that really has equity at its core. And though we really are planning this as a multi-year process, we thought it'd be a good time to share some of the work that's already been done to really give you um, some ways you might approach your summer planning and decision making using equity as the through line. And we do know, and we can see this in the poll, that many of you are already doing this work. So hopefully you can use some of what you hear today to sort of build on and intersect with work you're already uh, doing. So um, today we've got eight facilitators um, on the call. Uh, Linda Braun, Lakeisha Kimbrough, and six of our amazing co-designers. Thank you all for being here. Linda Braun of the LEO Project provides project management training and consulting to schools, libraries, and out-of-school time institutions. And Linda specializes in developing learning experiences for both informal and formal educational settings. 
We also have Lakeisha Kimbrough here with us today, who's been guiding us of LK Consulting and Coaching. And um, Lakeisha is a youth and family advocate, a warrior for racial and social justice and liberation. She works at the Center for Community Engagement at Seattle University and leads workshops centering healing as a vital component of renewal, transformation, and liberation. Lakeisha's work seeks to lead in the healing of historical traumas and their legacies. Also on the call, we have six amazing, I keep using that word, members of the 2020-2021 Building Equity-Based Summers co-design team. And Linda's going to introduce them all in just a little bit. And also on the call, we've got Natalie Cole, the California State Library's Bureau Chief. And Natalie, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to say before we hand things over to Linda. Yeah, thanks, Trish. Uh, I would actually like to say good morning, everybody. And um, thank you for being here, um, our presenters, um, our project team, and everybody who's come here to the webinar. Um, I've been involved in this project and just seeing the amazing work that has happened so far. And I want to thank everybody for everything they've done. You're going to see the State Library do, um, you know, more work with an equity lens. We're learning a lot from what's happening with this project. We hope that, you know, you will too, and you'll be able to not just take this away for summer, but also see the intersections with the other work you're doing. Um, you'll see um, at least one other member of the State Library team on here, Bev Schwartzberg. Um, we are committed to making the connections between the different projects we support. And she um, not only leads our literacy project, but also our California Libraries to Learn uh, training, professional development work. And, you know, we are we're very committed to, to seeing the connections and to take what we learn from one project um, to another. There's Bev giving us a wave. So, you know, we are both here and um, we are eager also to hear how this conversation develops. Um, and it, if you have any feedback, don't hesitate to let us know. Um, we're just so pleased to be able to support the this work with LSTA funding. And thank you, Trish. Great. And I think at this point, Linda, it's all yours or Linda and Lakeisha and the co-design team. Great. Thank you, uh, Trish. And thank you, Natalie. I too am really excited to be here and so happy to see 73 people in this room, including the co-designers, Lakeisha, et cetera. Um, so I just want to really briefly uh, talk about how we've been doing this work, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lakeisha. And so over the past, since September 22nd, 2020, we've been working with 14 teams of two from libraries across the state from different jurisdictions. And every other week, we zoom and focus in on what it really means to embed equity in summer services. And we've learned over this these many weeks that this is not an easy task and that we have a lot to do and we have a lot to think about. And so the co-designers are talking about everything from um, reaching out to community, to incentives, to performers, to budgets, to um, library structures and systems, to all different kinds of resources. And eventually we're going to, well, we're working very uh, carefully to build some tools that you can all use as you look at equity and start to embed equity into your summer services. And um, I'm so excited to see that 70% of you are already intentionally thinking about that. One of the things we wanted to do today is to give you a chance to learn some of what uh, the co-designers have been learning. And just also to say that the co-design process is one in which we're learning from each other. We're coming together and just talking about different things. And through that, we're designing together uh, what you're all going to be have access to and hopefully use over the next several years. So before I turn it over to Lakeisha, I just wanted to introduce our three teams of co-designers who are going to, Lakeisha is going to be presenting on equity-based decision-making, and then the three teams of co-designers who are able to be here today are going to be talking about some of the work they've been doing, and then we're going to give you all a chance to talk with each other about um, equity um, and decision-making and summer services. So like I said, we have three teams of co-designers here from the San Diego County Library. We have Jody de la Pena, Pena and um, Ari Jimenez, and they will be talk, speaking first when we get started in this. And then we have Victor Soberg and Isabel Riggs from Altadena. 
and they will uh, follow Jody and Ari and Molly Weta and Lisa Gonzalez from Santa Barbara will be um, finishing off uh, that section. And they have all, all of the co-designers have been doing amazing work. And we couldn't, when we were talking about who to select, who to invite, who to bring in, um, who to see if they were available to be a part of this. Uh, I think it was Natalie and Trish were like, well, they're all so awesome. They've been doing so much great work. So um, everybody uh, has been such a great part of this. I'm really excited that we're able to now let you all know what we've been working on. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Lakeisha, who's going to get us started thinking about and talking about equity-based decision-making. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, thank you, um, Natalie and Trish. Thank you, Linda. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Um, and in, in the interest of just kind of honoring time and making sure that you have a um, significant amount of time in your small groups to do some more thinking, um, this might be just under 45 minutes. Um, and we are going to look at why equity-based decisions and how we might be able to um, make equity-based decisions. And what I will share too is that, the, that as a team, we've been looking at appreciative inquiry as one model to bring that or one framework in which we can um, bring equity-based decisions in, but you can really bring equity-based decision-making into any framework that you're already using. Um, and so I think it's important to note that and to share that, that you don't have to be doing using any particular like framework. Um, the quality principles that California Library System has um, are beautiful. So we're gonna really focus on why equity-based decision-making and how can I do that? We'll start with a little bit of um, deep breathing, well, some breathing exercises. We'll do a land acknowledgement. We'll do a humanity statement. Um, beautiful people, and then we will um, have a little bit of reflection on both the land acknowledgement and the humanity statement, and then we'll get into our time together um, today. So I'm so excited to be here, and thank you so much. I invite you in this moment to go ahead and do what you need to to get comfortable, perhaps that stand up or adjust your posture in your chair. Perhaps um, it is turn your video off if it's on. It might be closing your eyes. But in this moment, I just really would love to invite you to take a big, nice inhale and really fill your lungs. And hold that. And slowly exhale. I'm gonna invite you to do that another time. A nice big inhale, holding for a couple of seconds. And a nice slow exhale when your body is ready. I wanna invite you to think about in this moment what your body needs from you what's happening in your body? Are your shoulders asking you to drop them or rotate them as you're following your body's breathing rhythm? Perhaps your neck is feeling a little tense and you'd like to roll that. your ankles or your wrists. As you're following your body's rhythm for breathing, I'd like to invite you to think about what you need to give yourself to be as present as you possibly can during our learning and growing time together today. That might be giving yourself permission to not check email for this time or not look at your phone. 
And what permissions do you need to give yourself to make that okay? Whatever it is that you need to do to be fully present today. Nice big inhale in, hold. Audible release for your next releases. So it might sound like, <sighs> really deflate that. Your audible release might sound like, hmm. I'm going to invite you to take another deep breath and exhale, and we'll come together for our land acknowledgement in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you, amazing people. I hope you're feeling a little more centered. I'm a little grounded right now. Um, and know that um, in this age of technology, should I be disconnected, I will rejoin as quickly as possible. Our land acknowledgement. Today we acknowledge and hold that we are engaging in the activity of learning and growing on the lands of indigenous peoples, occupied ancestral lands that quite often were not and have not been ceded by indigenous caretakers of the land. We have and continue to hold to benefit from the fruits of their labor. We honor the ancestors and elders of the land, extending the same honor and gratitude to their descendants. We acknowledge that while colonization and genocide have taken a significant toll emotionally, physically, spiritually, and economically, the terrorism of neither colonization nor genocide have been completed. And I ask you to hold that for just a couple of seconds. Thank you. Our humanity statement. Today we acknowledge humanity as a sacred gift that has been bestowed upon us all. We acknowledge the attempts over generations that have been and are being made to deprive some of their humanness, their humanity. We acknowledge that to attempt to deny the humanity of some means to deny the humanity of all. Today, we hold and acknowledge both our individual and collective humanity. In doing so, we make intentional connection to and with self and others, and in so doing, actively engage in an act of resistance against oppression. I ask you to hold that for just a few seconds. I'm going to invite some reflection into the space. Linda, if you can help monitor chat, would that be okay? Yes, I will Perfect. definitely do that. Thank you. And I see um, our transcription kind of got off track a little bit. But I know that in both the humanity statement and the land acknowledgement, there, there might be language there that feels re-stimulating for some folks that might be hard for some folks or that really resonates. And so before we move on, I'd like to hold space and offer space for folks to share what, if anything, came up for them, um, what's resonating or resonated for you um, in either or both statements, and what might have been challenging to hold. 
So I am wondering, um, and I will um, offer silence so that folks can process for a few moments and, um, and either type into chat or come off of mute. And if you come off of mute, would you share your name and where you're joining us from? Keisha, someone's just wondering, um, Ann Wilson is wondering where the statements came from. Did thank you write you. them yourself? Yeah, thank you, Ann. Um, the land acknowledgement was written with some guidance um, and um, forgive my error, I am joining you from Seattle um, from on the lands of the Coastal Salish peoples and more specifically the lands of our Duwamish sisters and brothers. And so the land acknowledgement in part was guided by um, the Duwamish uh, and then in part by the work of uh, Nancy Luna Jimenez. So it's a, it's a creation of some of me, some of the Duwamish and some of Nancy Luna Jimenez. The humanity statement was something that I had been searching for and I hadn't seen. And so I thought I would um, take a try at crafting. And so in the humanity statement, what you see is, is my attempt to craft something that invites us to um, lean into honoring and holding our individual and our collective humanity. Thank you for your question. Other thoughts or feelings, and please feel okay to say, I was challenged by some of that wording or um, share anything that resonates. We'll pause for a couple more moments. Erica says it was lovely and she appreciated both of the statements. Thank you, Erica. Okay. If things do come up for you as we move forward, Please do not hesitate to share them in chat. We'll bring that into the space um, or bring it into your small group sessions or pause, ask me to pause as we're thinking about what equity-based decision making can look like. Um, and Keisha, we will I'm gonna ask you to pause for a minute because there's okay. a more question. Um, yeah. What made you create these statements and when would you find them most appropriate to recite? Mm, beautiful question. The land acknowledgement um, for a number of reasons. For me, I, I feel um, that they can become performative and it's not for me performative. It is really wanting to acknowledge and hold and bring into space awareness and remembrance that the lands upon which we are weren't not, uh, they were discovered by someone who hadn't been there, but they weren't discovered as in no one's ever been here. They're not new, you know? So, and that ways of life um, in, in the way that America became formed, ways of life were transformed in ways that were horrific um, and not that beauty didn't come from that. Um, but there, there has been some beauty that has come out of some trying and hard times. And for me, it is really honoring those who came before us, who helped build the spaces that we live on. Um, also, I have Lumbee heritage and indigenous Mexican heritage in my family. And so it's also a way of honoring and holding my Lumbee and indigenous Mexican heritage as well. Um, and for the humanity statement, it was really, um, it is really for me, the belief that systems of oppression ask us to stay disconnected from ourselves and from others in order to thrive. And when we are able to connect with and to ourselves and with and to others, we are able to hold our, our own humanity and the humanity of others in such beautiful ways that really allow us in just that simple act of holding our humanity that can be challenging sometimes, that really pushes against systems of oppression and in some small way begins to disrupt. Um, because if I can hold my humanity 
and hold your humanity, then I know any act of oppression that's being enacted against another human being is also being enacted upon me. And so um, I think in terms of when it's appropriate, I think they're starting any type of event. Um, I think it's appropriate even at, in family spaces, if there's a family gathering, um, depending on what the dynamics are in your family. But I do think any public event or even any committee event, um, our department starts with um, acknowledging the Duwamish people before any of our, our staff meetings. So I think um, that there are multiple spaces and times when it's appropriate. Yeah, so um, there are a couple of other things, but Lakeisha, I think we probably have to move on. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. So what I am curious about, and I think the next, so we won't be able to get to all of the things today. And that's what that slide before just said. We, <laughs> we're just gonna skim the surface, but please start populating chat. When I think about equity-based decisions, I think about what comes to mind for you. Does it's hard? I think about budget. I think about community. What comes to mind for you when you think about equity-based decisions? Should I read them out, Lakeisha? Or are you yes, them? please. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, a few, um, oh, no, no. I was wondering if <laughs> things are coming in. That is yes, great. Yes, they are. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Inclusion, time consuming, reaching people who are scattered around the city, getting pushback and resistance, bringing the focus on people. Someone saying, I'm worried I don't know enough to make the decisions. Community and children. Am I forgetting anyone, anything? Unhoused children making library services and events accessible, seeking out who are not uh, serving, better channels of communication. Nice. Great. And all of these things um, are definitely things we want to hold as we are making equity-based decisions. Um, and I, I want to speak really quickly to do I know enough? One of the beauties about equity-based decision-making asks us to not put that all on one person's shoulders, right? So we're thinking in terms of team and partnership, uh, and we'll see that in a little bit. Um, I also think pushback is real, and there are some beautiful ways in which we can embrace the pushback and help folks um, get to a space of feeling like, oh, okay, this this is actually beneficial for me and for everyone um, around me. So hopefully some of the how and the why in equity-based decision-making that we'll talk about um, brings you to that space. My 30 minute timer went off. I started a timer at exactly 10 o'clock so that you all could take 60 seconds to stand and stretch. Close your eyes, look away from the computer. We know that um, looking at the screen too long, lots of folks' eyes are getting dry. So we'll come back and start exploring equity-based decision makings. What are they in 60 seconds?
Wonderfully zestful people, we are back. What are decision-based, equity-based decisions? What are they? They are decisions that center those they will impact. So when we're looking at a an equity-based decision, we are holding who are the folks who will be most impacted by this decision. That's one of the first things we wanna hold. Um, which members of our community are going to be most impacted by this decision. They are decisions that ask us to work collectively and in partnership. Equity-based decisions are a process. They're typically not something that we can make um, within just a number of hours, sometimes we can, but they usually require a process. And so therefore they ask us to not get caught in urgency, but to hold momentum. So oftentimes we, um, real, we think, oh, I really wanna do this and I have to hurry up and get it done. And then we start to operate in a sense of urgency. And when we do that, we begin to miss some steps. We begin to miss reaching out to some people. And then our decisions aren't really as full or as healthy as they can be. Um, and what I want to offer is um, even in time sensitive spaces, we can begin to kind of evaluate, okay, we know we have a time, this is time sensitive. What can we do? between now and when, um, when our deadline is, when we have to get information out or when we need to start moving to the next step. Um, and hold that part of momentum are those quiet and down spaces where maybe we're reflecting and we're um, taking in what we know. So momentum versus urgency. And it can be a good thing to pause and sometimes ask ourselves, are we working in urgency or are we following momentum? Equity-based decisions are a way toward a more just, a more transformed, more liberated systems, <clears throat> excuse me, and programs. So it's just one way to get us more towards um, the transformation that we're looking for in our society. Why in the world do we wanna make equity-based decisions? Why, if they take time and if it's this long process, why would we do that? When we're making equity-based decisions, it really encourage us, encourages us um, and encourages our programming or to create programming that authentically reflects what the community needs and wants. And it can be really easy as folks who are creating programs and delivering programs um, to get into this pattern of, oh, we, we know what folks need and want um, because we've been doing this one particular program for 20 years. So we know that that's the program that folks want when um, that might be, but what else might folks be needing or wanting um, and how might folks be needing and wanting you to respond um, to what is taking place. Another reason for equity-based decision-making is because it interrupts systems of oppression by allowing folks to connect, um, to connect with you um, in a work way, to connect with one another in community, to connect across communities um, in some very beautiful ways. And again, once we're in that space of connecting, we're learning and growing um, with ourselves and with others, and we're breaking down some of those barriers and some of those things that systems of oppression have put in place to cause us to engage in an act of othering. So as we're able to connect, we're also able to begin to affirm one another and affirm ourselves and validate our experiences and validate our individual and our collective worthiness. Affirmation says, I see you. Affirmation says you are important. Affirmation says you have something to bring and we want to embrace that and hold that as we also offer something to you. And so that's another reason um, that we would love to engage in equity-based decision-making. Equity-based decision-making creates space and offers the gift of healing. 
as you're engaging and work with your communities and the communities are beginning to come together, there can be a sense of healing from past um, and historical wounds and traumas and healing of relationships between um, some folks don't have great history with institutions, for example. And so it's a great way to promote healing on a number of levels. And again, the why, it brings us closer to justness and to transformation and to liberation. How in the world, that sounds so beautiful, Lakeisha, how in the world can we do this? One of the things we wanna do is explore why and who, right? So why are we making this decision? Why are we at a point where this decision feels like it's one that needs to be made? Um, and who will this decision impact? Who's making this decision? So asking ourselves why and who, and we can use that from uh, just blatantly saying, why are we making this decision? We can also say, I'm curious about why now for this decision? I wonder who this decision will impact. Um, so we can also use curiosity and wonder, which can soften it for us sometimes if we need that. We want to make equity-based decisions using a little bit of examination and reflection. So that means we wanna look at some of our current decisions, some of our current policies and current ways of doing things. And we, want, and, and we also wanna look at how have we traditionally or historically made decisions? How have we traditionally or historically engaged um, with members from other departments who are, whose um, input might be necessary? How have we done this with the community? And we wanna ask ourselves, how have the ways we've engaged potentially perpetuated harm? How have they potentially aided to, the, um, to perpe perpetuating harmful systems? And it's not a value statement, right? It's not a, oh my gosh, we did this and we've done that in the past and we suck and we're bad. It's not a value statement. It is simply an assessment of this is what we've done in the past. We now see where that was probably not the healthiest thing. Now, how do we grow from that? How do we learn from that space? And you wanna look at also your successes and your wins where you're like, oh my gosh, we've been doing these things and they've been so beautiful. And how do we carry those forward? How do we use those successes and wins as we're exploring those spaces where some of our decisions have potentially caused harm? We want to bring as many voices to the process as possible. So as many, um, if the program is for youth, as many youth and young um, people's voices, as many caregivers and family voices as possible, as many folks who work in the library system that you're in, how their voices, um, and you wanna bring in community partners. So boys and girls clubs, rotary clubs, um, whatever, community organizations that you're partnering with, bring their voices in as well. And we also want to engage in ongoing reflection, some personal ongoing reflection around what this work means to us, what our why is in this work, and organizationally, what is this work mean for us as an organization, as a department, how are we engaging in this work? Where do we see our biases as individuals arise? How are those biases um, potentially carried out in the decisions we're making? What are those biases, right? We don't wanna just um, say, oh, bias is in operation. We wanna be able to say things like, wow, I'm really operating out of confirmation bias when this happens. I wonder how I can interrupt that. I wonder what that looks like more fully for me. And then start to explore how we interrupt those biases in our work and in our personal, in our personal lives and um, spaces of engagement. 
So that is the what, why, and how in a nutshell of equity-based decision-making. Um, and I want to just add some things for you to think about and hold. Equity-based decisions are not rushed. They are a process. So they do ask us to give ourselves the gift to slow down and pause when that's available. They involve many voices and they ask us to share power with our stakeholders. Our stakeholders will be other colleagues, community members, um, other organizations, but they ask us to share power with our funders. Equity-based decisions ask us to examine how previous decisions have been made and really do that with an eye to really learn, not an eye to shame or guilt those past decisions, but just to learn from them um, and to learn and think about why those decisions were made and what those impacts were. And sometimes we want to get and understand from community what the impact of those decisions were. We, we might be able to guess or assume, but as many voices as we can hear. Um, so if you're doing evaluations of your programming, look at them for impact, um, perhaps. Equity-based decisions hold that there are many ways to reach the same destination and to honor that. There are many ways in which um, a, a library might engage in summer reading, right? There are many um, different ways to honor and hold what literacy is and what it looks like and what it sounds like. And we can bring many of them into the space. It asks us to hold that there must be multiple supports to ensure that everyone can benefit from that decision. And in this, we're holding that perhaps we wanna look at liberation, um, language liberation. So are our materials translated? Um, looking and thinking about folks who, um, maybe struggle with reading? Are we using icons and symbols and images along with um, words? Are we going out into the community and are we asking the community to come to us? Are we thinking about the times that programs are held? Um, so lots of thinking about what, how we're, um, how we are delivering our programs and, and how folks can benefit and what supports we might need to put in place. And then it incorporates a variety of things. So looking at our budget, how do we, where, um, how are we using our, our, our financial resources? Um, how are we advertising? Is it all online? Um, what are there various social media aspects? Many folks are using TikTok. Are we using TikTok? Um, so just thinking about ways that you're reaching out to folks. And again, that access piece um, in terms of programming times and um, a combination of going to the community and the community coming to us. Um, I am looking, Linda does not see me looking at her, but I am looking at Linda just to gauge time. Um, I, was, and, I was just looking at the agenda to gauge time. So yes, I think I think um, we're at time. We're well, no, we've got a couple of more minutes for questions. Actually. Perfect. Um, yeah, go for it. Perfect. So if folks have thoughts or questions um, that you'd like to type in chat or um, share in mute. Or I'm sorry, share off of mute, not share in <laughs> mute. That would be interesting, right? Also looking at and thinking about this, what are some wins that you've been celebrating as you heard this? Because you were thinking, oh my gosh, we already do that. Or what Not are just, ways? Mm -hmm. Oh, go for it, go, Linda. No, I was just gonna say that Anne said that was a lot to take in. So I think also recognizing that this is a big uh, it is. set of ideas. So I like that, that what are the things you're already doing because it helps to process it. Mm -hmm. That's great. And thank you for naming that, Anne. That was a lot just given to you in a short amount of time. 
And, and I do want to offer that it is really important as you're um, engaging in a process of equity based decision making to really honor and hold and celebrate those wins that you have. Um, yeah. There's uh, Charmaine is saying, uh, thank you for these ideas, especially translating signs and flyers, um, making them more accessible. Uh, she's been having trouble, uh, they have been having trouble figuring out where to get started to make things ex ex accessible. Um, and so she's at, they are asking, would you say starting off with making sure we have translated signs is a good idea? It's a beautiful start. It is a beautiful start, Anne. And that's, and, and um, I'm sorry, Charmaine, that is a beautiful, beautiful start. And um, you're reminding me that um, you do, you don't have to do everything and try to do it all at once. You can say, we, we would love to start this process with looking at how our information is disseminated. And we'd like to start with translating our, our materials and partnering with an organization if that's what's needed to get our materials translated, knowing what are um, the languages that are uh, most commonly spoken by folks who use, utilize the services at your library. So that's a beautiful place to start. Um, and also knowing that small steps are steps and that they have impact. So um, you can think, think, think a dream really big. What would this look like, feel like, sound like if we're really engaged in this in you know, six months or a year? And then bring your dream down to, okay, what can we really do right now? And perhaps it is in the translation. Perhaps it is in offering programming at a different time. Um, or because you've learned from members of your community that um, they love the idea of the programming, the timing just doesn't work, right? Lakeisha, I have a follow-up question to that. And I'm just thinking like when you start with that, that's a first decision that actually then helps you start talking with people about mm -hmm. it, right? And build off into other decisions, right? So I think it's like a step but it, and it's a really powerful one because it gives you those kinds of opportunities. Am I exactly. thinking about that correctly? Definitely, yeah. And uh, Charmaine is following up with thank you and it's good to know where to get started. Yeah. Oh, now you can see chat. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and it can feel overwhelming. So that's another reason why I really invite folks to embrace moments of pause, um, to say, to celebrate wins, to say, wow, let's look at what we've done and what we can learn from it. Let's look and see, um, you know, how we might, we, we're already doing some beautiful things. How might we just reimagine it a little so that it um, furthers the work that we're hoping to do? Um, where are there seeds that are planted? And we just have these seedlings of things starting. So we're not really sure what it looks like. Let's give it some time to grow. Let's nurture that, that seedling um, and nurture it with equity-based decision-making in mind and see what happens. Um, and then also thinking about what can we put in place to support one another so that that overwhelm doesn't turn to burnout, right? Um, because we want to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and one another, self and community care, y'all, and that you're centering your joy in this, centering your peace, even when it's challenging and hard. You get to say and acknowledge, this is overwhelming, and I feel overwhelmed because of course I'm feeling overwhelmed. We're looking like we're coming through a pandemic and there are certain things we just don't know. That's overwhelming, right? So validate what you're feeling. It's real um, and it will help you move through in healthier ways. 30 more seconds or a minute for any other questions or comments for Lakeisha or each other.
Um, hi, uh, my name is Tierney. I'm from the Livermore Public Library in the Bay Area. And I am a little bit, I guess, really, I'm very intimidated by the thought of starting like all the, the mm -hmm. outreach to community organizations or to other partners that need to be involved in these decisions. Do you have any advice for beginning that process? Yeah, and so you're thinking about tyranny, thank you, um, like possibly reaching out to schools or other community-based organizations? Yes, that's what I'm thinking mm -hmm. about. Um, so I think one, one way that I have found um, helpful is to um, either if I have a phone number or an email address, and sometimes it, it's just finding the courage to, um, to, to look at their directory or to, um, to make a phone call and say, you know, my name is Tyranny and I work at um, this library and we're engaging in some work just, you know, if it's the, the young people, for example, and I would love to set up time to learn from you what you're doing in the community and how we might be able to partner. Sometimes it's thinking about partners that you already have or that there's partnerships there and it's asking to join one of their meetings as an observer and a learner because you would love to think about how to partner and I'm really curious about what you're already doing to support the community and how we might be able to partner to strengthen that support for the community. Um, it can be a quick email. It can be um, asking someone who that you know already has a relationship with that particular organization um, and asking them to, I was just in one of those meetings today, um, asking them, say, would you be willing to set up, um, set up a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting for the three of us to talk about the work that we're doing um, and how that work might intersect? Um, so, was that helpful at all, Tierney? Yes, that was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Lakeisha. And um, Charmaine, I see your question. I think that's one that you can um, ask when we get into the small groups and then also as there's time at the end. I think that'd be great. It's a good question and I'm sure others are thinking about that too. So um, I'm going to move us on to our co-designers are three teams of co-designers who are here with us and the first team is from San Diego County Library and that is Jody and Ari and uh, Holly has your slides coming up and so I'm going to time you for about five minutes and I'll give you a one minute warning and then um, we'll we'll move on so Jody and Ari you are on thanks Linda Hello everyone, my name is Jody Delapena, the Youth Services Manager for San Diego County Library. And I'm Mariana Jimenez Barrios, a Teen Services Librarian for San Diego County Library as well. So as Linda said, we're here to talk to you about and share our experience working on this committee and offer a glimpse into how our approach has shifted um, and we're able to re-examine summer learning through a new lens. While we've learned a lot through this process and reflected on many things, Ari and I will be focusing on three of these mental and professional shifts. So you'll have plenty of time to hear from the other amazing committee members. Slide, Holly. So the first mental shift I encountered happened at the beginning of our work on the committee. As a branch librarian, one aspect that I was always proud of was the access to services that libraries offer and have historically offered. I had always heard and believed just by simply existing in neighborhoods and offering services, we were leveling the playing field. We were challenged on this committee from day one to think beyond access, not only to do it better, but to think about enriching engagement, meeting people where they're at and removing barriers to access. Access is not always equal. I'd like to mention that through the work we've been doing, we're look, looking at summer reading through a different lens. Instead of focusing on our own, own spaces and bringing people to, to us to participate, which became very clear can be an unrealistic expectation for many people, how can we meet people where they're at? Non-library users, 
homebound individuals and children that just don't have transportation to engage in our spaces. Just by shifting our approach, we're able to be more thoughtful in services we provide. This, as mentioned by Lakeisha before, is a process, and I keep discovering areas that I, as an individual and as a librarian, can improve upon. One of the easiest and surprising ways to do better was to be more representative with our summer learning book prize selection. It surprised me that I hadn't thought of that before. It not only offers participants an opportunity to see themselves in our selections, but simultaneously sends a message to our vendor when we specifically request and purchase these materials. It shows that these authors, characters, and subject matters are valuable and important. So I could go on and on and tell you about what I've learned and how inspired I've been, but I really want you to hear about Ari's experience as our teen services librarian. Thank you, Jody. So a key point um, we've reflected on since embarking on this project has been to reimagine how we engage with community partners. Um, they are instrumental to library events, but also to how library plan programs can successfully reflect and burst best serve our communities. Um, an example of this is during the first phase of this project, we conducted an exercise where we reached out to community connectors or assets. Um, from this, some of the experiences uh, within the groups, it was highlighted the importance of building trust, setting clear goals and objectives uh, from the interaction or partnership. This gives a clear pathway for partners to understand and help each other attain each other's goals. In our case, uh, we reached out to a local organization serving people within the autism spectrum. And through this informal interview, we gained some insight as to how this community group might view the library and services, um, some of the challenges that people within the autism spectrum face when accessing our facilities and services, including summer learning. And um, this interaction allowed us to reflect on how we can better communicate the message that Summer learning incorporates a mix of reading and activities, not just reading. That some of the activities help with independence building and that uh, guided reading counts towards reading goals regardless of the age. These are things that as library workers, we might think of as a given, but messaging can be more clear to promote inclusiveness. Our perspective to planning summer learning has definitely shifted, as Jody mentioned, and continues to evolve as we participate in the equity-based project. We continue to learn and reflect on ways that we can reach out to the new and non-dominant community groups, how we can best listen to the feedback, and how we can integrate this knowledge into our summer learning practices for both library staff and the public. So we thank you for letting us share our experience. Thank you, um, Ari and Jody. That was quick, but really um, you reminded me of a few things and I think a good starting off point to see how that work has gone. So now we have Victor and Isabel from the Altadena Library, and they're gonna be talking about what, how their work is changing when it comes to summer uh, services. Thank you, Linda. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Victor Kravai, and I'm the Assistant Library Director here in Altadena. And I wanted to start off by sharing some basic information about our district that will help you contextualize what we're about to talk about. Um, we're located in Altadena, which is an unincorporated area of Los Angeles County. And uh, it's about eight square miles. Um, and we have two library locations and provide services to about 52,000 residents. Um, also important to note is that we are an independent special district. And as such, we are solely governed by a locally elected board of tr library trustees. And we can go to the next slide. Um, on the left here, you're seeing our library mission and our values. And our teen librarian, Isabel Briggs, is going to talk about uh, our participation in the Cohen Design Sessions and how that has inspired us to further embody these statements. Thank you, Victor. Um, yes, so I'm Isabel. I'm the teen librarian at the Altadena Library District. Um, and when putting together this presentation, I sort of tried to think about some big takeaways that I, Victor and I have discussed. Um, about what we what we're getting from this from this project or this co-design project. 
Um, so our main question was like, how can we reimagine and redesign, you know, our services to more fully embody the values that we already have? Um, and there are a few key points. We talked about, you know, considering community needs beyond reading, um, exploring if there were other things that we could address in um, emphasizing more open-ended learning experiences. So rather than a very linear summer experience, creating something more, uh, <laughs> more uh, sort of user-led, I guess. Uh, we really wanna focus more on underserved groups that we don't see using the library. So who are, you know, we have good participation in our summer programs to date, but like, who are the people who have not been participating so far? We wanted to think about how we can decentralize the library through stronger partnerships. So making our summer services like not about the library, but making it more about like, how can we be a connector? How can we be a facilitator? as opposed to maybe like the only hub of activity in Altadena. And we really thought about a lot about outcomes and how we can really uh, look for, for measures of success that aren't necessarily participation numbers or um, like uh, matriculation or something like that. And you can go to the next slide, please. So we've rebranded um, and we're no longer doing summer reading at the library. We're doing a program that's called Our Summer at 2021 at the Altadena Library District. Um, and you can click again to the next slide. Um, so I wanna sort of quickly go over some new approaches that we've integrated into the Youth and Family Services program and the teen program. And then Victor will finish up talking about adult services. So for youth and family services, which is basically our children's department, you know, we again asked, as Lakeisha said, like, what's the why of why we do this? Um, and for children's, it, it's, a, it's a little bit easier to answer because I think that the summer learning gap is still a really important reason to do summer reading. Um, so we were like, yep, that is what we're doing. That is our focus. However, we also really want to think about, we wanted to think about other community needs that might come up. So we've done a cup, we've done one and we're looking to, at a second partnership where we're offering more tailor made reading challenges for elementary schools and foster homes. So that uh, as opposed to like a one size fits all summer program, we can do sort of little micro projects. Um, our, we're giving away kits, which we did last year. And those kits have a mix of craft supplies and books. And it's really to encourage flexibility and that families can use these materials however they want to. Um, they don't have to follow along with our programs if they don't want to. And we're really focusing more on uh, mobility and like getting outside of our library buildings. We're gonna have a new mobile library unit this summer. So we're really planning to use that a lot in our programming in order to, and doing like pop-up events at parks and stuff like that. So that we're, we're really meeting people where they are. Um, so that's sort of an overview of YFS. Uh, for teen services, we're focusing more on, or, um, creating a really, a really open-ended program that focuses on sort of exploration and just summer fun, whatever teens wanna do, as opposed to just reading. Uh, we're not gonna have any registration or completion markers. Um, the programs for teen services are really gonna be very unstructured and more about socializing and rebuilding connections after a pandemic, um, as opposed to instructional. Uh, we're making a, instead of a tracker, uh, I'm working on making a, a sort of homemade um, summer guidebook that's going to have a lot of different resources for exploration. So that includes reading logs, you know, journal prompts, maps, resources, like activity ideas, just all sorts of stuff so that teens can take that and go and make whatever experience they want to from the summer. It's not about the library telling uh, patrons, like, here's how to participate in our program, you have to jump through these hoops. It's really just giving a much more open-ended experience. And we're trying to think about new ways of measuring that success. So for me, the goal is really just like maximum distribution. And I don't know if I'll see some of the kids at the library again, but it's really just about like giving something to them and um, as opposed to sort of expecting something from them in return. And as opposed to doing prizes throughout the summer, we're doing a final prize, but that's an incentive for filling out our program evaluation in order to sort of get more feedback from 
teens and participants and see what they want to do in the future. So that's that's my portion. Thank you, Isabel. And I um, want to briefly talk about adults as well, um, because we're taking a little bit of a, a very different approach to, to this here in Albedina. So I believe that in order to provide equitable library services, we have to move beyond any assumption of what our community needs or wants. And to do that, we need to invite new people to sit down at the table with us, and we need time. So with that, the biggest immediate consequence is that we're not doing a reading program for adults at all this year. In fact, we're not really doing a, a summer program for adults either. And instead, we're thinking long term, and we're approaching this as kind of our sandbox period, where we're developing uh, new ways of designing programs and services for all ages. Um, because as Isabel already mentioned, during our appreciative inquiry work, we found that the, the really ma the magical moments happen when we talk to people that we don't normally talk to and when we were open to unexpected outcomes. So in a sense, we're expanding on our existing missions and we are, we're now bringing new people and new ideas together and setting that as the focus because when we focus on the people that are already engaged with us, sometimes um, outreach becomes some, somewhat of an awkward thought. So our, our only intention for the summer is to connect with those that have not participated in a traditional reading program. And we're pairing that with the action of establishing or deepening relationships with individuals, organizations in the community that are actively working with the populations that we would like to learn more about. So we're essentially rethinking our role uh, from being a producer or sometimes you know, a, kind of an idea factory working in somewhat of a vacuum um, to being a listener and eventually a co-creator, much like this session has been with all of the libraries in, in California working together, we want to work that way locally too, to design our services from the ground on up. And with Lakeisha's statement of systems of oppression thriving when we are disconnected, that's the statement that we're channeling this summer um, as we're laying the foundation for our long-term work of building a more connected Altadena. And we're grateful for this opportunity and being governed by the library board solely is definitely helpful in this sense because we're able to tell the story of the work that we're doing and they see the value of this altered approach. And I want to also thank the California State Library for their support of us doing this deep intentional work. Thanks, Victor. Um, you want to bring up, you have one more slide, I think, that has your um, email addresses. And next, we have Molly and Lisa from Santa Barbara, who are going to talk a little bit about what this has all been like for them. You two are now on. Um, good morning. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the State Library and all of the other collaborators that we've had through this process. It has been a really meaningful experience. It's been a lot of hard work, but I think that it has really been helpful and necessary and productive work. Um, I think what I'm gonna talk about is kind of the history of where we started with summer reading a few years ago and how we've evolved over the process and then pass it over to Lisa to let her talk about what we're kind of currently working on. So I like to think of this process as a continuum of looking for continual process improvement that we have made small changes over the last several years to try to get closer to a more inclusive and more equitable uh, summer reading program. So don't feel like you have to tackle every single aspect of your program or make dramatic changes all at once or get it perfectly right the first time because we have definitely tried some things that we didn't end up wanting to move forward with that we've changed a lot over the last years. So I started at Santa Barbara about five years ago in the summer of 2016. And we had what I tend to think of as a very traditional summer reading program. We had a paper log, you registered, and then you reported how many books you read in multiples of five to get very complicated packets of prizes at the different levels. Um, so it was really hard to give an elevator pitch for summer reading and just say what it is and what you get and how you do it in a few sentences to new families. And it was very labor intensive for staff in terms of the tracking and the distribution of the prizes. So over the last five years, we introduced an online system, hoping that that would ease some of the tracking. We found that that wasn't necessarily the case, um, but was 
an important part for certain people in our family, but also did not, absolutely did not work for other families in our community. And so we're looking to go with a hybrid model where you can do a program online, but we also have a paper um, coloring sheet that has challenges. So it's something fun and um, engaging to look at and then has just ideas for challenges. We started with that very prescriptive five book uh, in terms of your tracking for all ages and moved to a hybrid model where you could count minutes um, and set a goal. And then last summer, we finally made the switch to set your own goal. We also, over the past several years, introduced challenges or other ways to participate that weren't solely based on reading, really focusing on letting people decide how to participate in the way that made sense for them and their family, knowing that not everybody is going to be in Santa Barbara for the whole summer, um, but maybe is only spending two weeks visiting family, but still wants to participate. Um, or that some people have families that work all the time and they can't come to daytime programs. So having activities that you can do on your own, in your own time as a family to, to participate, having incentives for participating in library programs as part of your summer reading experience. And then um, also the, the re emphasizing reading, but not exclusively, really celebrating all types of learning over the summer. Um, as far as prizes, we had moved from very like coupons where you get maybe a discount or a little tchotchke to trying to give free experiences and emphasizing museum passes, um, introducing a free book at sign up rather than completion just to really reward people for participating in the idea. And this has all helped to increase access, reduce barriers to participation and um, not make people jump through so many hoops in order to do things our way. Um, and then uh, really de-emphasizing prizes uh, this particular year to see how that goes and is uh, received by our community. As far as programming, we made a big shift away from puppet shows and magicians and big performer type programs to theme-based learning and family engagement. And then also, emphasize more outreach and that we're going out to the community, working with partners who work with those that are disadvantaged, low income, Spanish speaking in our community to bring the library to them rather than expecting them to come to us. And that has had great success and we've really strengthened relationships with those partners um, because of that. And um, really centering those um, and, and getting feedback from our families on what makes the most sense from them. So it's definitely been a journey and we've learned a lot along the way. And though we were already kind of on a trajectory of looking um, at summer reading through an equity-based lens, I think this very intentional program that we've done with all these other libraries has really helped us identify gaps and areas of improvement. And so I'm gonna let Lisa tell you what we've been working on recently. Hi there, I'm Lisa Gonzalez from Santa Barbara. Um, and I just wanna emphasize what the other teams have said um, about, first of all, take the pressure off. The moment that we are trying to make this perfect equitable summer program, we have slipped into white privilege thinking because we're gonna be urgent about it. We're gonna be really stressed about it and we won't have the space to see what we're not seeing. Um, so I know it's, it's so hard to think about how do we change to make our program more equitable? But the, one of the things we started with on our teams, which I really appreciated was, let's look at what we are doing and see what's equitable, equitable about it already. Because I suspect that there is not a library in California that's not doing something, at least some part of their program is really trying to reach everyone in town. So, so starting with their strengths and playing off of that, we can do small changes that make a huge difference. For example, Molly talked about our, our improved relationship with partners and emphasizing certain partners. One of the things we're gonna be doing this year is opening up registration for some of our programs, pre-registration with some partners. So if you, you might see an invitation to participate in our program through the housing newsletter, if you belong to the city housing authority before the general public and our library newsletter that reaches, you know, I don't know, 20,000, 40,000 people, something ridiculous. And there's all these super users that get their kid that goes to every library program in right there that, you know, and fills up all those spots. So, um, Oh, trying to do registration through partners. We uh, we started, we did some focus groups. We said, you know, we haven't heard from the community. It's COVID, but we're going to do it. We went out and um, had our team reach focus groups. We actually gave um, $10 gift cards to the supermarket so that um, some families would take 
a, a time to talk with us um, and, and honor their time that way. Um, and we got some interesting feedback about the split between I like electronic tracking, I don't. Um, one thing that was very, very clear is that no one wants virtual programs in our community this summer, which is very interesting because um, it might, <laughs> safety wise, it's, it puts us in kind of a difficult situation. Um, but we would not have known had we not talked to the 18 people that we talked to. And we talked to partners as well as families to hear what um, the needs are right now, especially right now with COVID, it's such a strange time. Um, we also have a Spanish outreach team that's been coming up with um, new ideas that started kind of in the midst of our, our, uh, our project here. About 50% of our local kids speak Spanish at home. Um, so it's really important that we make sure that we are reaching families. And if we want to encourage family interaction, we really need to include materials in both English and Spanish. Otherwise, we're only reaching half the families. Lisa, I'm going to have to. I'm sorry. One last word. That's OK. I saw that we were I saw that we were <laughs> yeah. way over on time. Um, uh, just one last thing is just looking at where the money goes to see when we're paying for programs um, or even tangibles. Are we spending locally? Is there a local business uh, that we can support? especially from a, a person who really struggled to make that their business. Um, and there's been open to innovation. Uh, we recently took our story walk program out to the junior high for special ed children. And they had the most wonderful time with that preschool program. And one of my librarians said, why would they wanna look at this book? This book is for four-year-olds. And I said, you know what, let's, let's try it. And they were so happy to be outside looking at a book and their teachers were so happy to see their kids outside looking at a book. So just being open to innovation and um, and throw in some things out the window, like registration. We're not going to count completion this year. We're going to count engagement. So um, some things are, they just don't serve us, and it's time to let them go. So that's so that's one of the things. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I have to say, one of the things I've loved about all of this is there's so much to talk about. I mean, from Lakeisha, like this is just starting. And that's one of the reasons our work has continued is because there's just so much we have to talk about. And so thank you for, to all of our co-designers. I know that was really fast and I was um, sending uh, direct messages one more minute, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, but so I really appreciate you're doing that. We're going to, um, facilitators and co-designers, we're going to re revise one of the things that Lakeisha has taught us all is that you got to go with the flow. So we're going with the flow. And instead of going into breakout rooms, we're going to have a um, large group discussion for maybe um, five or so minutes uh, with, I'm going to put in the chat our question and then I will read it as well. And so what's an idea uh, or way of thinking that you heard from the co-designers um, or Lakeisha that was like, ah, ah, that's something new, an aha moment. And so you can um, put it in the chat. We'll start that way. And then co-designers, Lakeisha, team, uh, you can uh, chime in as well. But let's hear what's an aha moment for you. Anyone who's who's in this room for five minutes, we'll have this conversation. Oh, engagement, not competition. Um, can you say a little bit more about that, Jennifer? If you wanna just unmute yourself, Jennifer, you could do that. Sorry, I meant uh, engagement, not completion. I thought that was Oh, that was oh great. it is completion. I obviously had competition on my mind. Do you wanna say a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Just what our previous uh, speaker, uh, Lisa, was talking about, I think it's great that we pull away from registration and completion and what percentage completed and really count those who embrace the program in any part over the summer. Great. Any of our uh, co-designers wanna um, chime in on that? And then Erica. Has I know I, I was talking about. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. We were figuring. Uh, we were figuring out that it's actually easier for us to count engagement than completion. Um, we were. That's actually one of the ways we got to that is we were trying to figure out what can we count that's not going to put a little a bit too big a burden on staff this mm -hmm. year, and we were realizing that if we try to figure out the last, you know, the last set of books people read, we'd have no way to do that. But if we just count how many interactions and how many times we're we're um, talking to people about their books, that's much easier. And to follow that up, I think something that Lakeisha mentioned that really has resonated with me is like, go where, where you find joy and mm -hmm. counting how many people participated and like help having them go through the motions of entering all of this into our online platform or 
not losing their paper log was not what brought us joy in the summer. It was celebrating reading and learning and talking and engaging with our um, community. And so that's where we're going to emphasize our time. And I think it can be a, a hard change because you've had statistics that kind of track the same metrics year after year after year and to give that up um, to introduce something new can be complicated. I think that we've been lucky and that we've made so many different changes kind of like small over the years that we've kind of given up that we're going to have a consistent level um, in the short term and um, our stakeholders recognize that there are different ways of reporting success um, and it may not be the standard way of reporting across all the libraries that the California State Library, of course, enjoys, right? They want to make it the same across all jurisdictions. But for us locally, emphasizing the good work that we do in the community rather than a statistic has been a lot more joyful in summer planning. I love that. Um, and not just a statistic. That's really great. Um, and so we've got a couple of other things related to that. Um, and that idea of you don't need to do it right now, I think is really, in, or it doesn't have to be like all done uh, right away. And I think Victor, that's one of the things that's happening in Altadena, if I'm uh, thinking about that correctly, is that you've realized that you could even take a pause um, to build with community. And that's sort of awesome. Does anybody else have I, thoughts about, you know, like take your time, uh, you don't have to get it done all right away? Well, I think that sort of speaks to Lisa's point, which I mm -hmm. loved, which is like, most of us are already doing something, something already, like, and I think, and this is part of Lakeisha's appreciative inquiry uh, moment, <laughs> like, they're see, seeing where you already do stuff well and then thinking like, well, how can I just do this better this year? Um, I think that's been a really great uh, way of thinking for me, especially since last year we had to do summer reading very differently because of the um, pandemic. And it's been good to like, okay, well, what were some things that we learned last year that actually work and, and going from there as opposed to being like, it's all wrong, or we got to do everything differently or something. Also, one of the things that kept coming up in the committee work that we did was where can I affect change right now? And where do I continue to advocate on a, on a higher level? So depending on the size of your system, um, it can be really frustrating knowing what challenges you have in front of you around vendors and insurance and things like that. Um, but, you know, I think all of us have come and, and shown you like there are small things or big things that you can change pretty quickly. And like um, Isabel was saying, you can just do something better. You don't have to reinvent a program or invent a new program. You can just evaluate what you're doing and just pivot on one thing to make it more representative or inclusive or accessible. So I would look just, just do an evaluation on that. Any other, oh, Lakeisha. I was just going to say, it reminds me to think about when you're doing your evaluations to really be asset based and, and to, um, so Isabel, that was a beautiful reminder of what are we doing well and how can we take what we're doing well and transfer that and use those skills and use those tools and use those methods to enhance and grow where we're seeing challenges um, and to, to embrace that it's not a measure of value, like we, we've we done it all wrong or it's all bad, right? Um, it's not, that's not it. When you get into that space, shame and guilt creep up. And then you begin to wep, you begin to weaponize the good work you've done and you don't get to see it and hold it. And you don't get to use it in meaningful ways. So really looking at what are we doing well? What are strengths and assets that our team brings and that our community brings? And um, how can we use that in those spaces where we'd like to grow? Thanks, Lakeisha. Another aha moment.
Linda in the chat, Erica shares um, celebrating wins and yeah. acknowledging that things can be overwhelming. And I think Sandra says just discovering activities mm -hmm. midsummer, right? For folks who aren't able to complete, I think maybe that came from the Santa Barbara Library. Like some families might be coming in because they're visiting family and they want to still participate, mm -hmm. right? So that's really beautiful. And giving books at sign up, letting patrons set their own goals was another one I see in chat. And Sandra just also added working from success and building on that. I love that phrase, working from success. Yeah. And I'll just say that that giving yeah. books at sign up, that change made such a difference in our community because instead of asking somebody for something like, can you give me your personal information and then start tracking all of these ways in which you participate in learning over the summer, we're saying, hey, we'd like to give you this free book and then tell you all about the ways that we're going to have fun learning together over the summer. It just flips that conversation from one of skepticism to new people who aren't like library mm -hmm. power users to ones of like, oh yeah, this is cool. So it's a, it's a good introduction. That's great. Thank you, Molly. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to Trish and just thank you from myself. Thank you all for being here and for our co-designers. You're just like doing some amazing, powerful work. I really appreciate that. And Lakeisha, I really appreciate every time you talk with uh, our group and help us to think about things. So thank you very much. Now, Trish. Okay, sorry, my dog is walking. There's construction, but just uh, quickly to piggyback on what uh, Linda just said to all the attendees. We are so grateful for your, for joining us and your interest in sort of growing equity as a through point and cornerstone to uh, all that you're doing in your communities, uh, to Jody and Ariadna in San Diego, Victor and Isabel in Altadena, and Molly and Lisa in Santa Barbara. Thank you for sharing your journeys with everybody. Uh, Linda and Lakeisha, thank you for leading us today. And then just finally, if um, your library has a team of library staff and a supportive administration team that would be, you know, that's interested in this kind of work, the Equity Based Summers Project really is looking to grow the numbers of libraries that we work with next, uh, next grant year. So uh, if you're interested in sort of joining the project uh, and think your library might be a, a good and open fit, please reach out to myself or Linda or Lakeisha or Carrie uh, and just we can start a conversation. So again, thank you so much to everybody that was a part of today. And I think Holly mentioned there will be a recording available and we'll send you the link to that recording. Um, and I'm not sure if who, some of us will definitely linger on the call till everybody leaves. So if you had lingering questions or comments, we'll definitely stay on the call to address those if, if, you're, uh, if you have something you wanna run by anyone. So again, thank you.